One of the most interesting aspects of the, the protest movement in the 60s is how few leaders there were, or certainly leaders of, of any permanent kind. Um, it was characteristic of the period that you had ad hoc leadership, um, which is a, both, a, both a positive and a negative feature. It's very difficult to build some kind of an enduring, ongoing movement <laughs> when the leadership, leadership keeps turning over so rapidly. On the other hand, there was a sense of anti-authoritarianism in every protest movement of this period that made it quite difficult for people to continue in positions of leadership. And often, interestingly enough, these leaders were not interested in continuing in that position. For example, Mario Savio, who was identified by the media as the leader of the free speech movement at Berkeley, very rapidly faded from the scene. No interest in continuing in this position, uh, not, uh, building a, a career as a, as a protest leader, but that was characteristic of a great many period, people during this period. On the other hand, what you did have is something that I would simply call influences, and a lot of the influence of the period was wielded by what might be called the minstrels of the period, uh, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, uh, other, uh, other such people, you know, the, the Who, the Doors, uh, uh, and so on. The music of the of the 60s deserves very special attention because um, while it often presented itself to the world in a kind of a funky way and, uh, tr uh, and so, it was often very sophisticated music. If you listen closely to the lyrics, it's the lyrics of uh, people who have um, been exposed to a decent amount of reading and, um, and uh, perhaps a college education and uh, they are not quite uh, um, out of the gutter or <laughs> out of the streets. Uh, they are often fairly well-educated and competent musicians and writers and poets. And their songs carry often uh, messages uh, astonishing for the popular music of a, of a society. You know, uh, we're talking about music that went out to an audience of millions. And it is so different from uh, the popular music of the Bing Crosby, uh, Frank Sinatra generation. Uh, that came before it. We're talking about songs that uh, voiced um, uh, protest, uh, political protest, uh, that expressed uh, irreverence, um, that talked about formerly forbidden sexual activities, uh, that talked about dope. Uh, and that, the music, got around uh, to an awful lot of people, especially the next generation down and coming up in the world. Uh, I wouldn't call this leadership because none of these people were political organizers, but it was certainly an influence released in the, in the world. So I think what you had is an enormous number of people who at various times injected an influence uh, into um, a, uh, um, a youth culture that was ready to hear it, ready to respond. And incidentally, in, in, uh, a large, in one of the points I always try to make is that uh, a lot of uh, those, uh, many of those influences were from from adults, uh, not from their peers. You know, I mean, the influence of a Paul Goodman during this period, uh, or of an Alan Watts, uh, uh, um, was you know, very great. Uh, and these are people of a distinctly different uh, an adult generation, but they had found an audience uh, among younger people who were looking for um, new ideas, perhaps irreverent new ideas, uh, and uh, and with a willingness to put them into practice.